Thanks for coming um, to another Center for Global Security Research Seminar at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. My name is Mona Dreiser. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today, Dr. James Atkin Acton. Sorry about that. James is the co-director of the Nuclear Policy Program and ho holds the Jessica T. Matthews Chair at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Last time he was here, it was longer ago than I thought. It was in 2014. It was after you published your book, Silver Bullet, asking the right questions about conventional prompt global strike. And if you're interested in that, I think it's still on our website. Um, as a video that you could watch. Um, his work spans a really broad range of nuclear policy issues, things from plutonium and Japanese domestic politics, nuclear deterrence and disarmament, um, and the root causes of the Fukushima accident. And he's a really good speaker, and it's always a pleasure to welcome him here. Um, his current research focuses on the escalation risks of advanced conventional weapons. Um, and today he'll talk to us about the risks associated with the dual use of the U.S. nuclear command and control assets and the trade-offs associated with the alternative architectures for the modernization of U.S. early warning systems. Um, his presentation will be about 35 or 40 minutes, which will be videoed, after which we'll take questions and answers until about 3.30 or until your questions run out. And with that, join me in welcoming James for his talk. The work that I'm presenting today was published last month in International Security. Uh, thanks to the uh, funder of the work, this is freely available on the website. Uh, so I don't have copies to distribute today, but uh, you, can, you, can, you can download. I'm assuming the lab subscribes to International Security, but if not, you can still download it free of charge. Um, since the end of the Cold War, uh, scholars and academics have written a lot about the risk of inadvertent escalation. Um, that is where one side does something that it doesn't consider to be escalatory, but its opponent does consider it to be escalatory, and escalation results. The focus has very much been on U.S. strikes with conventional weapons against Russia or China in a hypothetical conflict. The central argument that I'm going to advance today is it's not just U.S. strikes on Russia and China that can be escalatory. It's Chinese or Russian strikes on US assets in a conventional conflict that can be escalatory. And the driver of um, um, these escalation risks is something that I term entanglement. Um, and entanglement describes the interactions between the nuclear and non-nuclear domains. Entanglement is not new. Um, the, uh, for as long as the United States has had nuclear weapons, we've been seeking to deter non-nuclear attack. I guess that's a kind of entanglement. It's not a form of entanglement that I think I have anything profound to say about, and I'm not going to focus on in this talk. Um, but again, I think there are f um, uh, four different drivers, four different reasons why entanglement is increasing today. Um, again, none of these are new. You can go all the way back through nuclear history to find some, but I think they're on the rise. The first one is non-nuclear threats, whether real or perceived, to nuclear forces and to their command, control, communication, and intelligence capabilities. The second form of entanglement is uh, C3I capabilities that are used for both nuclear and non-nuclear operations, dual-use capabilities. Uh, and these are the, 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 I put those in red because that's going to be the focus of my talk today. Um, but entanglement is a broader phenomenon, I just note, than those two particular forms of entanglement. Uh, Dual-use weapons are uh, another form of entanglement. Uh, this is literally as old as the nuclear age. Obviously, the, the B-29 that, that dropped the bomb on Hiroshima was a, de wasn't designed for nuclear missions. That was a dual-use bomber. Um, nuclear weapons nu delivery systems that are superficially similar to non-nuclear systems, things like the Chinese DF-21 series of missiles. That's another form of entanglement. Uh, nuclear weapons and non-nuclear weapons that are in the same locale or, or, or next to one another, or C3I capabilities that are next to one another. That's another form of entanglement. But as I say, the two forms of entanglement that I really want to focus on today are non-nuclear threats to C3I capabilities and to dual-use C3I capabilities. Um, I think there are four reasons why this form of entanglement is increasing today. Um, the first one is that non-nuclear weapons are becoming increasingly capable. Um, at the end of the Cold War, um, the, um, um, 
it, it, you know, based on the open source, it appears that both the US and the Soviet Union had some kind of non-nuclear anti-satellite capability. Um, I think there's very clear evidence that non-nuclear anti-satellite capabilities pose a much more potent threat to US satellites today. Uh, and I should have said this before, but obviously when we're thinking about C3I capabilities, uh, we are uh, in large part thinking about satellites in geostationary orbit or highly elliptical orbit, satellite used for principally early warning and communications. Um, ISR satellites in low Earth orbit are another important part. You also have ground-based radars, transmitters, airborne transmitters. Um, but anti-space weapons clearly pose a major threat to those space-based assets that is increasing. Uh, High-precision conventional weapons pose a threat to ground-based uh, ground systems. Um, cyber weapons um, uh, are another potential threat to C3I assets. The second driver of in, uh, the, the second technological development is again looking. This is obviously based exclusively on unclassified material, but it appears that there had to me that there has been a reduction in redundancy of the United States command and control system compared to the end of the Cold War. In part, that's because some systems have been scrapped and never replaced. For example, the extremely low-frequency antennae for communicating with submarines, that system was just taken offline and never replaced. So rather than having two systems for communicating with submarines, ELF slash LF and... Let me get this right. LF slash VLF as one system and ELF as another system, we're just left with the first one. Um, there's also a reduction in redundancy because, again, as I understand it, as budget documents suggest, there's an effort to harmonize... Uh, receivers for satellite signals on different delivery systems. If you have the same receiver on different delivery systems and there is, for example, a cyber vulnerability in that system, then that one vulnerability could lead to the potential for attacks on multiple different delivery systems. Third form of, third reason I think entanglement is increasing is because I think I, the US is becoming increasingly reliant on dual use C3I assets. Um, the U.S. has always used dual-use C3I assets. As I understand it, no U.S. communication satellite has ever been nuclear only. Um, uh, but I think there is a trend line here. Uh, at the end of the Cold War, there was the first use of early warning satellites for operations uh, uh, for purposes other than detecting a nuclear launch. It was actually, at least on the unclassified level, the detection of Soviet backfire bombers was the first non-nuclear application for the defense support program satellites. Um, but when you move on to SIBRS, which is an, uh, the space-based infrared system, which is an exceptionally capable satellite, uh, it absolutely does the non-nuclear warning part. So, sorry, the nuclear warning part. It also is involved in queuing um, uh, missile defenses against non-nuclear ballistic missiles, for example. Um, the same is true of the paved pause radars uh, which were designed to detect uh, uh, incoming nuclear weapons, but when they're upgraded to turn them into uh, upgraded early warning radars, perhaps the most original name in, um, in, in, in military nomenclature, um, they're then tied into the ballistic missile defense system for intercepting non-nuclear ballistic missiles. And then finally, um, all three, China, Russia, and the United States, I think there is pretty clear evidence in each case that each state is interested, is developing plans and capabilities in a conventional conflict to attack the, it, it, its adversaries' C3I capabilities, non-nuclear C3I capabilities. The problem is that many of those C3I capabilities are dual use. And as a result, you get what I term incidental attack. You get the potential for incidental attacks in a conflict. So these are attacks on C3I assets where the state undertaking those attacks is interested in trying to undermine its opponent's non-nuclear warfighting ability. But by taking out dual-use C3I assets, it inadvertently undermines its opponent's nuclear capability at the same time. Let me give you an example. Imagine that in a conflict between the United States and Russia, um, U.S. missile defenses are proving, regional missile defenses in Europe, are proving effective in knocking Russian non-nuclear ballistic missiles out of the sky. 
there is evidence that in that scenario, Russia would try to degrade the US early warning system, including perhaps by launching attacks, kinetic or non-kinetic attacks, against Sivas. It would, in the process of doing those attacks, undermine the United States' ability to detect uh, nuclear attacks against the homeland. Um, and as a result, this creates a risk that over the course of a non-nuclear war, the nuclear C3I architectures of the belligerents could potentially become degraded. Um, and I argue, like, not a, like, you know, clearly no one thinks this is a good thing. I also argue it, can, it has the potential for being inadvertently escalatory. A lot of the paper paints out three different pathways by which escalation can occur. Um, I don't want to belabor those today. There's some other aspects that I want to look at. Um, but very briefly, uh, one pathway which has been discussed extensively in the literature before is crisis instability, uh, which is where, and this is most likely to result from US attacks on Russia and China, where if in a conflict we were starting to degrade their dual-use C3I capabilities, which I think we might have incentives to do if we were losing the conflict, Russia or China might interpret that as uh, us trying to deprive them of their nuclear deterrence. Um, and they could respond to that in various ways, including you know, in extremists by using nuclear weapons, but perhaps also issuing nuclear threats. The other two pathways here, I think, are most likely to happen to us, Russian or Chinese strikes on the United States. Uh, the first one is misinterpreted warning. So going back to um, the Sibers example, in which Russia uh, starts, in which, in which US missile defenses start to prove effective in shooting Russian non-nuclear ballistic missiles out the sky, the Russians attack Sibers. How do we interpret that? Well, one way we might interpret that is there's evidence, again, from the Russian literature that Russia will consider limited nuclear strikes against the homeland if it were losing a conventional war. Um, Russian strategists are also worried that limited nuclear strikes might be shot out the sky by the ground-based mid-course system. Reasonably or unreasonably, they have that concern. Therefore, from our perspective, uh, attacks against Sibers could appear to be paving the way for, not, for nuclear, limited nuclear strikes against the homeland. Um, and that's what I mean by misinterpreted warning. We, we, we've got some, you know, we're, Russia's clearly sending a warning by shooting Sibers out the sky. It's not necessarily trying to signal it's about to shoot the homeland. We may interpret that way. Even if we don't think Russian nuclear use is imminent, I think there's another escalation pathway here, which is something called uh, the damage limitation window. Um, the Nuclear Posture Review openly acknowledges that the United States would seek to limit the damage it would suffer in a nuclear war. In trying to do so, there's a lot of academic debate about whether we could be remotely successful in doing so. But in trying to do so, we would need exceptionally sophisticated enabling capabilities. Um, ISR, early warning, um, communications. If we were worried that that, early war that, that uh, uh, command and control infrastructure would be severely degraded by the time, of a, nu by the time a nuclear war started, um, sorry, let me, let me re uh, reverse that sentence. Uh, if Russia started to attack those early warning assets, those communications, those ISR assets, or even if we were just worried it might do that, we could be worried that by the time the war turned nuclear, damage limitation would become completely impossible and completely unthinkable. In either case, misinterpreted warning, or if we were worried that this w window of opportunity for conducting damage limitation was going to close, I think we would have strong escalatory incentives. The Nuclear Posture Review, in fact, threatens to use nuclear weapons if command and control assets associated with nuclear forces are taken out, the, uh, are, are destroyed. So just a, uh, you know, that was one of the big changes in my mind in this Nuclear Posture Review. So I don't think we could rule out that the United States would be um, um, uh, willing to use nuclear weapons in these scenarios. I think it's more likely we might start to issue nuclear threats if the adversary didn't back off from attacking uh, command and control assets. Uh, we might also launch, a th uh, start to do things like attack uh, anti-satellite weapons deep within Russia and China as a way of preserving the early warning uh, and communication system. Um, if we hadn't done those deep strikes to date in the conflict in an effort to keep the conflict limited, they, they, they could be uh, very escalatory. So 
these incidental attacks against dual-use command and control assets, I argue, in, in various different ways can create risks of inadvertent escalation. For obvious reasons, given the audience, what I wanted to talk a bit about today was to focus on the early warning system and what I think the particular vulnerabilities are there. And to, to give you some thoughts about um, alternative ways of, of uh, 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 alternative architectures and a very, very simple framework for thinking, for thinking through this vulnerability problem. So the first thing to point out is that SIBAS is involved in nuclear, is dual use. It's involved in both nuclear and non-nuclear operations. I've given you the example of, obviously, uh, early warning of a nuclear attack, uh, non-nuclear ballistic missile defense. There's, in fact, another completely different way in which SIBAS is a dual use system. Uh, the Pentagon has openly acknowledged that the SIBAS satellites in highly elliptical orbits, that's the ones that are going to be good for seeing the poles, or the North Pole, the Northern Polar region, rather, um, that they are hosted payloads. That is not a dedicated um, satellite, unlike the ones in geostationary orbit. Uh, the Pentagon describes the satellite that uh, hosts this SIBAS HEO detector as a classified satellite. Uh, rightly or wrongly, it's reported in the open literature as being an electronic intelligence collection satellite. If that's right, there's only one reason I can think of why one would have an electronic intelligence collection satellite in polar orbits, and that's to spy on Russia. So again, that's a yet another incentive in a conflict for Russia to take out that detector. The target might not even be the detector. The target could be the satellite, and the detector would, could just be collateral damage in that strike. Second point to make is that, so, so because of the very heavy dual-use nature of the SIVAS system, Adversaries, particularly Russia, I think, because of the HEO satellites, but also China as well, could have incentives to attack them. Second point is that even limited attacks against the Sibir's constellation um, could be very problematic. When, I think it was General Shelton was the commander of US Space Command, he openly acknowledged there was a single point vulnerability in the Sibir's constellation. He did not say what that was. But I think if you just look at the architecture of the constellation, it's pretty clear what it is. You need two SIBAS satellites in highly elliptical orbit to continuously monitor the northern polar region. If you take out one of those satellites, then you lose continuous monitoring of that region. Um, and incidentally, with, this is increasingly important because within, you know, during the Cold War, before there was a very significant climate change, maybe Russian subs had some kind of ability to launch SLBM through thick ice, much more of an issue now, and it will be much more of an issue going into the future. Um, there's a dual point vulnerability in the Sibir's constellation. Um, if either of these uh, HEO satellites are taken out, and the westernmost of the geostationary satellites, then the US loses the ability to do space-based monitoring of potential Russian uh, SSBM patrol areas in the North Atlantic. Um, but the, you know, and, and added to that, you know, either Russia or China would have incentives in theory in a conflict to try to take out every one of these satellites that could see where they were launching non-nuclear ballistic missiles from doing so. That's not every satellite, but it's a lot of the constellation. Now, at one level, one can say, well, we have a degree of redundancy here because we have ground-based radars. Um, you know, the, the Pave Pause radars, the um, Cobra Dane radar, um, and, and potentially other assets that may or may not be hooked into the early warning system. I think there's two reasons why this should not give you much comfort. Firstly, because the policy is dual phenomenology, right? US policy is that it wants to be able to very, very sensibly characterize an incoming nuclear attack through two independent technical means. And if the goal is to do that pre-detonation, left of boom, then, you know, as far as I can see, there's only two means for doing that, the radars and the um, early warning satellites. So there's no redundancy at a systems level in that case. The second reason I think the existence of the radar sh should, shouldn't give you much comfort is because particularly Russia would have a very strong incentive to take out one ground-based radar in particular, which is the one at Filing Dales in the United Kingdom. Um, because that one is close enough to a European theater of conflict that it, it, uh, it, it could provide tracking for Iskander ballistic missiles. 
Um, and if the Cybus constellation was starting to be degraded, that radar in the, in the UK is incredibly important for early warning because it's by far the closest one to Russian missile launch sites. And if that one starts to be taken out as well, I think this, this appears very, very worrying from a US perspective. So I wanted to talk a bit about, you know, I, approaching, having, having identified this problem, one wants to be able to try to say something useful about how to solve it. And this is a really difficult problem to solve. Um, in theory, I can imagine a cooperative process between the US and Russia and the US and China. Uh, in theory is the operative words in that sentence. Um, I think for any number of reasons, not least of which is, you know, bad US-Chinese relations and really bad US-Russian relations, I think it's impossible to imagine that cooperative process getting off at the, off at the ground at the moment. So most of my thinking has been about unilateral steps. What can the United States do? What could other countries do if they were interested unilaterally to try to reduce some of these escalation risks? Um, and I think one of the big opportunities coming up here is we're at the beginning now of this process of trying to recapitalize the entire US nuclear command and control architecture. Um, it's hard to have much visibility on this process from the outside. Uh, my concern is that we're just going to rebuild a more capable version of what we have at the moment. Um, certainly the plans for the new early warning system, uh, as far as I can see, just basically imagine rebuilding SIBERS, actually with less redundancy, because rather than having four satellites in geostationary orbit, the new plans, as far as I can see, appear to call for three satellites in geostationary orbit. So what I want to try and do is just inject some thinking about um, not... Uh, 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 trying to think more creatively about alternatives. Acknowledging from the outset, I don't know what the answer to this problem is. And part of the reason I was interested in talking to a technical audience um, is precisely because it's not going to be me that works out what the alternative architecture is. It's probably going to be people at this lab. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to kind of um, um, just share some ideas, recognizing from the outset, I don't know what the best idea is, and all of these ideas have huge trade-offs associated with them. That said, I think there's two basic strategies to trying to uh, reduce the risk of attacks on US command and control assets, in these incidental attacks in particular. One can try and reduce the, reduce the likelihood of attack, and one can try and reduce the consequences of attack. Reducing the likelihood of attack involves some form of deterrence trying to convince the other side their attacks won't be successful, trying to convince them there will be costs to that. But it necessarily involves shaping perceptions of the adversary, and that means saying something publicly about what we're doing. The alternative is to try to reduce the consequences of an attack. Um, we may or may not want to try and shape adversary perceptions in the process. We may or may not want to keep what we're doing secret on this. You can't reduce the likelihood of attack if what you're doing is you're keeping it secret. You can reduce the consequences of an attack by keeping it secret. It may or may not be possible or desirable to keep it secret, but you may want to keep it secret. In some cases, these two basic objectives can be in tension to one another. Let me give you an example. Um, I don't think we have developed dual use I think we develop dual-use systems because it's a lot cheaper than developing two independent systems. But it's a form of deterrence in a way. Right? There is an entirely legitimate, valid deterrence strategy of going, if you shoot early warning satellites out of the sky, even if it's just for a conventional operation, you have to know that you are undermining our nuclear command and control system, and you will have consequences to pay. So entanglement in that way can be an entirely rational deterrence strategy. But essentially what you're doing there is you're trading one for the other. You're trying to reduce the likelihood of an attack by deterring the adversary from attacking satellites by you know, saying there are going to be terrible consequences from doing so. But by having this entangled architecture, you're, in, you're increasing the consequences of the attack. That said, these two objectives are not always intentional. Right? If we just tripled the number of Cybers satellites, right? we're not going to do this, it's far too expensive. But if we just built a whole load more satellites, I think that would serve both objectives simultaneously. It would clearly reduce the consequences of an attack by adding more redundancy, 
And one would hope that there might be a degree of deterrence by denial. We'd say you would have to take out so many satellites, you know, hopefully you would think your attacks wouldn't be effective. So I just want to point out that these two basic objectives can be intention, but are not always intention. Um, let me talk a bit about different ideas for how to reduce the likelihood of an attack. Um, one of the ideas that's been suggested a lot is to try to disaggregate command and control, to have a conventional system to the extent possible and to have a separate nuclear system in the hope that, um, you know, the adversary then wouldn't start going after the nuclear system. This is technically possible when it comes to communications. It may or may not be a good idea, but it's technically possible when it comes to communications. I think it is not technically possible when it comes to early warning for a very specific reason, which is the advent of Russian and Chinese dual-capable missiles. China fires a DF-26 that, according to probably authoritative Chinese sources, can carry nuclear or conventional warheads. If we can't tell whether that warhead is, if whether that missile is nuclear armed or conventionally armed based on the plume from the missile, which we wouldn't be able to, we just f technically can't disaggregate early warning into nuclear and convention, into, into, into nuclear and non-nuclear components. So I, I don't view, whether it's desirable in theory or not, I don't view the disaggregation of early warning as technically possible. The kind of thing that I imagine one could do is as a supplement to SIBAs, um, one could put a whole load of small hosted early warning detectors up in space. What I was imagining here, like the inspiration comes from a Cold War system called AFSATCOM, which was a communication system. But during the Cold War, the US had a small number of very, very sophisticated communication satellites called the Defense Support, uh, sorry, the Defense Satellite Communication System, DSCS. And as a supplement to that, put a whole load of trans communication transponders in space hosted on other satellites. Communication satellites, non-communication satellites, I believe both military and civilian satellites. Exact number up there is classified, but reports from the early 80s expected there to be about 30 of these transponders up there by the end of the decade. Um, I spoke to actually a missile ear who dealt with this system, and he said it wasn't very good, um, you know, but it was it was a backup, you know, it, 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 it provided a degree of redundancy. We could do exactly the same thing when it comes to early warning. We could just place a whole load of small um, early warning detectors in space as, as hosted payloads as a supplement to SIBAs. We might also think about whether we could convince the adversary, Russia or China, uh, that these transponders really were only use, well, were not primarily intended for uh, non-nuclear operations, that their main utility was nuclear early warning. If we can convince them of that, then they would have less of an incentive to attack them. Um, there's two ways in theory that I could imagine doing that. Uh, whether they would believe either one of them is a very, you know, I, I don't have much hope here, but you know, hear me out. Um, one of them is imagine we just put physically small detectors on these hosted payloads. Um, you know, low diameter detectors, uh, perhaps just a few centimeters across. Uh, that would produce low resolution imagery that would be kind of useful for nuclear early warning, but much less useful for pinpoint accuracy of detecting where a ballistic missile was to trigger missile defenses. Uh, and, you know, one could exhibit these things to the Russians and Chinese. Say, look, you know, look at the diameter of these detectors. You understand diffraction. You, will, you go and work out what the, what, it's not a very difficult calculation, you know, 1.22 over lambda. You go and work out what the resolution is. You can see these are not going to be very useful for ballistic missile defense. Uh, another idea, which wasn't mine, but is say, we, uh, say these detectors were tuned to an IR frequency that could not penetrate the atmosphere. So the only missiles these backup detectors detected were those were long-range ones that went out of space. Into space, it would be more useful for like ICBMs than short-range missiles. I think it would be harder to convince Russia and China that there was about what frequency they were, they were tuned to than the size of the detector. But you know, I think it's worth thinking about if we did this backup system, we wouldn't want it to be attacked. How could we 
try and convince adversaries not to attack it because it wasn't useful for uh, um, um, non-nuclear missions. As I said, there's trade-offs with all these ideas. You know, one of the big trade-offs here is I think you probably do weaken deterrence of attacks against cybers. If you have a backup system in place, then you're kind of, you risk saying to the other side, you know, it's less dangerous for you to attack cybers. So, you know, there are absolutely trade-offs here. Um, another thing, another approach here is to reduce the consequences of an attack. Um, so one, one thing one could do is just decide to scrap, basically scrap Sibber's replacement entirely. Um, and rather than having a small number of super capable satellites, stick up a much larger number of medium resolution detectors as hosted payloads. Um, you know, if they're hosted payloads, they're not going to be so big, you're not going to get the incredible resolution that Sibber's does. But maybe, in the, you know, one thing one can consider, and again, real trade-offs here, but is trading redundancy for capability. Stick 20, 30 medium resolution detectors up in space as an alternative to SIBAS. Um, you know, in theory, although one starts to get into real cost issues here, one could try to stick those medium resolution detectors up in addition to SIBAS. Um, but you know, as I say, I think one is hitting potentially re real cost barriers there. Um, the other, the, other kind of the other technology, when I was trying to think through you know, how to make this architecture more redundancy, the other technology that occurred to me is weather satellites. I mean, weather satellites are basically early warning satellites at a different frequency. I mean, they're telescopes that look down and are tuned, in some cases, to infrared frequencies. Um, so again, something else that one could do is, uh, and this I think, for, or, you know, you one would have to try and do this secretly, um, but, you know, I think weather satellites at the moment are not, you know, tuned to the right band IR frequency for uh, missile early warning, um, but it would presumably be not too expensive in future, uh, we, you know, if one designs it in from the start, to develop weather satellites that could be a backup to early warning satellites in a crisis. This is not easy, right? One would need all the communication architecture. Um, I'd also point out that the weather satellites that are probably best placed for this are allies' weather satellites. Um, you know, European countries have weather satellites that are pretty close to Russia. J Japanese have weather satellites that are pretty close to China. Um, you know, one could think about involving adversary, uh, uh, um, um, allies in this process as well. Um, let me, let me end by just kind of emphasizing what I've been saying all along. I don't know what the best answer to early warning vulnerability is. Um, I'm sure that more creative technical people than I am can think up many more alternatives than what I've put up there. There is clearly no silver bullet, no panacea. Every single one of these has trade-offs. And I'm certainly not going to claim that I know what the right answer is. Um, I think the thing that we want to avoid is by essentially bureaucratic or military inertia, just doing what we've done again with more capable satellites. Um, let, me, let, me, let me end that there and thank you for your attention. Really looking forward to having a conversation and questions and your ideas, but thank you for your attention.